I brought this back to the principles, the peace practices that we founded the school on, which are self, family, community, and world. Those are the peace practices that appear on our logo, and they are the fundamental aspect of why the school started. Understanding that we each come from different cultures, we each come from different communities, but we're all here in Costa Guanacaste learning together. So, again, I'm going to speak from experience, and I'm going to go through each of those self-family community world to share with you how our understanding of those four components allowed for the success of our organization. Again, it's not a formula, it's just food for thought. Uh, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Uh, I am not a yogi and I'm not like totally uh, into yoga, but at the same time I understand and respect a lot of the philosophies that go along with it. One of the things that we preached in our organization is the importance of taking care of yourself in order to be able to take care of others. Many times, in specifically in nonprofit work, specifically in nonprofit work in developing nations, we put so much of our time, effort, and energy into the others. And many times that comes at a great cost to ourselves. We need to think about the big picture of life and why we're here and so on. Um, so I encourage all of our teachers to find that inner peace and that balance. Uh, to look inside and understand where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are so that, of course, they can prove on their weaknesses, but also is recognize that if I do have a weakness, maybe someone else has a strength that can, that can compensate for that and that I can use that for it. Coney 2012, who's heard of it? Does anybody want to share a little bit about their understanding of this movement? So Coney 2012 was put out by a nonprofit called Invisible Children. We got like 40 million hits on YouTube or something crazy like that. And then there was a lot of controversy about the fact that a lot of information in, in the video was, was kind of false. And that maybe the way the organization ran itself was not entirely transparent, but they did a great job of creating a million dollar movie that spread across the world like wildfire. Well. Yeah, I mean, this went, this went viral. I think it's up to 86 million views on YouTube. A lot of controversy surrounding it, which you can go and research yourself. But what fundamentally brought it down, there's controversy around any organization. There's always some different critics and so on. I believe, and a lot of critics believe, is that the, the person in charge was arrested in San Diego in late March for obscene acts, all kinds of things that aren't worth, worth repeating. He was clearly overwhelmed and stressed out by the amount of responsibility that was on his shoulders. And after that happened, within a week, the hit stopped. And everything just kind of, the whole organization, all of the great work that they've done, because they've really done some, some very interesting work to provoke some great dialogue in, in, in the world about a, a, a challenge that, that, that was happening. But, because in this case the leader, one of the visionaries, didn't seem to be able to find that inner peace, it kind of just crumbled. You could read more about the story, but it is something that's interesting. Taking care of yourself is very important. Cultural empathy, uh, in terms of things to work on for yourself, some of you may have read the book by Daniel Pink, A Whole New Mind. Uh, he really preaches about a new skill set that is essential for success in any organization in the 21st century, specifically related to empathy. How well do we put ourselves in other people's shoes? How well can we understand when we're in their shoes how they're feeling? You know, to put it in layman's terms. And uh, I encourage each of you to check that book out. It, it blew my mind and uh, in terms of the whole new way of thinking about leadership and, and, and development of uh, specifically nonprofits as well. Another controversial topic for some of you who are up on nonprofits. Three cups of tea, Greg Mortensen. Incredible. I don't know how many schools it was, but yes, eight, four, two, four, hundreds, two hundred. You're yeah, right. Um, what one? Despite all the controversy, I think it's important to take one thing from that book which he had, which is yes, this cultural empathy, combined with the fact that he invested the time to have those three cups of tea with many, many, many people in order to realize his vision. The idea of taking the time for those three cups of tea, wherever you are, I think is essential, rather than coming in with your agenda, whether it's a community or, or a 
the organization. So one thing that I ask you to reflect on is how can you ensure that you and your colleagues are feeling balanced in order to effectively invest the time necessary to run your nonprofit? I think, again, related to the self, how well are we taking care of our family given the amount of time and effort and energy that we're putting into this invaluable work, for sure, for the world. But what I talk about, and what my family continues to talk about, is finding that balance that you as leaders are comfortable with. Um, it's, there's no, again, there's no formula for it, but it's, it's food for thought. What do Steve Jobs and Donald Trump have in common? There's a lot of things they have in common, of course. Uh, but one thing, it's not a joke either, one thing is that uh, they have in common that when they were interviewed, Steve Jobs right before his death, and Donald Trump, it was like two years ago in 60 Minutes, they said, what's one thing you wish you had differently done differently in your life? What's one thing that you could go back and change everything? And they said, I wish I had more time to spend with my kids. I wish I had spent more time with my family. Interesting. And perhaps you wouldn't necessarily think that. I mean, they created fundamental changes in their various avenues, uh, made lots of money in different ways, of course, and uh, they both came back to that one fundamental point. So, again, take it as it is. Obviously, all of you have different family lives and experiences, but it is something that we, we do talk about here in the pod, the importance of family. The other Friday, a community member said, hey, let's go to Cartagena soccer soccer game. And Cartagena is just down the road, uh, about 30 minutes. They have a Division II professional soccer team here in Costa Rica. And they, uh, and I think one thing led to another, and it was a family trip out there. And it was a promotional trip by the team to raise money. So they brought in the number one professional team from Costa Rica, which is called La Liga. And it was a big affair, and it turned out to be, sorry, the number two team, number three team. <laughs> one of the top teams in Costa Rica. One of those mojones, mojones like people in Costa Rica. Um, anyway, what turned out to what was intentionally supposed to be a family affair quickly turned into um, a work affair, because basically it was like the who's who of Guanacaste. So it turned into, it was, it was actually kind of a nice balance. I was able to kind of have my family there and, and uh, interact with all these people from who helped make shape the school in the way that it is. Um, so it was think, thinking about kind of how, how to maybe include your family potentially in, in your experiences is also, I think, important. Could be a stretch, but, but I'll, I'll throw it out there as well. Um, and then, of course, the reflection. How does your time at work balance with your time with family and friends? Because we are only here for a short period of time. Like, you need to recognize that. Community. This goes back to what Gabby was talking about. Has anybody heard of the wild dog approach to leadership? La Paz was founded on this wild dog approach to leadership where basically each of us has our own skill set. Sarah is an expert in curriculum. My wife is an expert in logistics and planning. I am a pretty good at communicating, I guess. Uh, and uh, we have a whole bunch of different people on our board who all have an individual skill set. And as a result, it doesn't have to go back to the person in charge to kind of do everything, delegate everything. Everybody kind of blends together and delegates. As long as we have a shared vision, we are able to swallow our pride and share leadership as long as we have a certain skill set that complements others and we have a certain tenacity to reach our final goal. And our final goal, of course, is to create this school and develop this school in order to give back to our community and create uh, a unique learning experience for the children of our, of our area and beyond. We'll see where it takes us. The use of local resources we found to be overwhelmingly important. In 2007, Costa Rica was exploding off the map. Everybody was investing in properties. Anybody who had two hands could run a business and make money off of it. It was, or one hand, whatever, or none. It was very simple to do that because there was just money pouring in here before the crash. As soon as the crash happened, um, unemployment went through the roof here. And 
most every business was shutting down in some form or, or downsizing in some way, shape, or form, which probably resonates with all of, all of you guys from your experiences from where you're from. But really what survived was profound. The businesses and organizations that survived were, were the ones that authentically integrated the local, specifically Juan Acaseco population, into their vision. The ones who welcomed everybody in and made it part of their mission to include everybody and to utilize everybody for their skills. And um, that was one thing that really stuck with me, especially our, our board of directors being a mix, a mix between locals and local foreigners. Each of them had their own talents that really made this place sustainable. So one thing to reflect upon is how does your organization utilize local resources to help achieve its goals? And then finally, the world. The world is flat. Another book, just another reference to consider uh, by Thomas Friedman. I believe it's now 35% of the people in the world have access to internet. So we're getting there. It's still a statistic that is surprisingly low, but with time, uh, we're, we're able to access more and more of the resources that we find online. And this will be the only reason that it was successful, it has been successful, not the only, but one of the key reasons is because of our ability to utilize resources outside of the community to help us kind of reach our goals, whether it's through fundraising. I put hope for cashier as I was going over this last night. I thought it was a perfect example of the world being flat. Um, and it's a perfect example of kind of a new generation of organizations uh, that, are, that are cropping up. But, I mean, you don't necessarily need to be face to face all the time to create pro like profound fundamental change in this world, which is what you guys are doing. So I thought that was uh, quite interesting. The cloud, of course, I'm referring to you know all of those online resources that we have that we can, that we can access. One of the things that I've been working with in, in, in my mind is, is many times when we, especially me being like a super maybe liberal, far left side person, as I started thinking more about La Paz and what we're trying to do here, we're trying to shift globalization to like here, like taking back the power of the word. It's actually an extremely powerful word, and there's no avoiding it. I mean, it's it's it's. It's already critical mass going in that direction of more and more globalization. So there's two things that you can do with that. And one is, of course, to reject it and, and try to kind of create your own intentional community somewhere, which is fine. Um, but the other is to kind of embrace it, embrace all of those uh, those resources that are out there, and to create a right towards creating a united and empathetic human network of, uh, to make this world a better better place. So uh, the reflection that I have on that is, can globalization lead to a more sustainable world? And maybe at first glance, you'd say, well, globalization, no, that's going to perhaps destroy our world. But maybe we can kind of flip that on its head and say, wait a minute, we can use that to our advantage and really bring everybody together for uh, more sustainable growth of this world. I leave you with Brazil, 1970 to 2004. Where did all of this come from? What's going on in my brain? The bottom line, what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve our understanding, understanding of ourselves and each other to create a better world. The reason I say Brazil 1970 to 2004 is because my parents were in the Peace Corps in Brazil in 1970. And um, 34 years after their visit, my wife and I went back. And we visited all these people that they had, they had influence. And to think about how two people could do that back in 1970, think about what we can do with all the resources we have at our disposal here and now. 2000, uh, or 2012. So it was a just wanted to share that final experience and how that you know, shaped my life and allowed me to, to put all this into perspective.